Good afternoon. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims. I'm the executive director here at the Institute of Politics. We are pleased today to welcome Illinois State Representative and Republican candidate for Governor Jeannie Ives. This is our last public event of the winter quarter, but we will be soon announcing our programming for spring quarter. You can learn more about those events upcoming on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. Last week, um, we had the privilege of partnering with WBEZ and Politico to host a forum with all six Democratic gubernatorial candidates. We extended equal invitations to both Republican candidates for a similar format, but Governor Rauner's office did not respond. As a reminder, the University of Chicago is a tax-exempt 501c3 organization, which means we do not support or oppose any political candidate for office. Um, a few notes before we get started. We will open up the floor to take questions from the audience. Please raise your hand, and our moderator, Paris Schutz, will um, call on you, and one of our student ambassadors will bring along a microphone. As usual, we give priority for the first three questions to students. We'd like to remind everybody that a question ends with a question mark. Uh, please make sure that your phones are on silent. And here to formally introduce our speaker is Terry Culpepper. Terry is a first year from Manila, Philippines, studying math and economics. He is a member of the College Republicans here on campus. Please join me in welcoming Terry to the podium. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all having a tremendous day. It is my distinct honor to introduce Representative Jeannie Ives, Republican candidate in the 2018 Illinois gubernatorial race. A staunch social and economic conservative all her life, Representative Ives graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1987 with a degree in economics, going on to serve in the US Army. She then became a member of the Wheaton City Council, where she demonstrated her unwavering commitment to conservative economic principles. In 2012, Representative Ives entered the public spotlight as she was elected to the Illinois General Assembly, serving the 42nd District. Ives has used her position to advocate conservative economic ideals, voting against bills such as SB 9, which sought to increase taxes to fund the state budget, and SB 81, which would have raised the state minimum wage to $15 per hour by 2022. Ives further applied her expertise by serving on boards such as the Labor and Commerce Committee, the Unemployment Insurance Subcommittee, the Workforce Reconciliation Subcommittee, the Task Force on Veteran Suicide, and the Discharged Service Member Task Force. It is on the social front, however, where Representative Ives would receive the most attention, especially as it pertains to the impending gubernatorial election. Representative Ives has become a vocal critic of current Republican Governor Bruce Rauner after his decision in late 2017 to sign HB 40 into law, which expands taxpayer funding of abortion and keeps it legal in Illinois even if the United States Supreme Court were to overturn Roe versus Wade. In addition to her strong stand against abortion, Ives is a staunch conservative on other social issues, passionately defending religious liberty and demonstrating support for traditional marriages and families. As of today, Ives has been endorsed by numerous Illinois legislators and officials and organizations such as the Illinois Fam such as Illinois Family Action and Taxpayers United of America, and is gaining increasing momentum in her gubernatorial bid. Today's discussion will be led by Per Schutz, a correspondent and segment host on WTTW. Now, on behalf of the University of Chicago, please join me in welcoming Representative Ives. Well, that was a terrific introduction. Wow, I was going to ask you about your political philosophy, but I think Terry kind of uh, kind of kind of ran it all down. Absolutely. I, so I want to start, and there's a lot we want to get to, and we're going to yeah. get to your questions too, uh, but we should dispense of what's kind of over the airwaves. Um, so so I'll, I'll give you a chance to answer this question. Are you indeed Mike Madigan's favorite Republican or somehow in the tank with him or colluding with him as that Bruce Rauner ad is suggesting. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous on its face. And, and you know this because you've been watching my work down there. You've been following what goes down in Springfield and nothing can be further from the truth. This is Bruce Rauner um, making up lies about me. Uh, the truth is, is that I have opposed Mike Madigan at every turn. I've been fighting Mike Madigan longer than Bruce Rauner's been in politics. 
And I'm proud of that because Mike Madigan obviously has been in power for so long that people uh, don't remember a time when he wasn't. And um, for decades and decades, he's responsible for, for the problems that we have. But you know, he's, he's made out to be the boogeyman. And um, you know, we, I think that the Illinoisans are a little more um, in tune with what's going on. And the truth is, is that Bruce Rauner could have ran his agencies effect effectively. He could have taken on public corruption. He could have done something on the economic front if he was even willing to stop the name calling with Mike Madigan. So if you were governor, how would you differ in your approach to dealing with the speaker? So we'll, we'll work with Mike Madigan or we'll, we will work around Mike Madigan to get our policies across because you see there's a fracturing in his caucus. They now are starting to feel the heat from their um, same voters who want something done on the economic front. And so the truth is, is that uh, when you build the coalitions for the su support and you make the arguments that need to be made about policy, you actually can affect change, which is why I've been able to work with my Democrat colleagues in passing bills like the Network Adequacy Bill last year and then a further bill on protecting condo owners as well. So it's when you make these arguments to folks, they cannot back away from the policy choices in front of them. So we'll work with them is if it, we have to. I mean, it, what Rauner is saying in his ads, are they out and out lies or out are they just, lies. just distorted? Um, mm -hmm. Is there a recourse that you have? Is there is there a response? Well, it's interesting because uh, it's really, we call it the Rauner Republican Party because he's basically bought and paid for so many politicians down there on our side because he's funding their campaigns just like Mike Madigan's funding Democrat campaigns and there's no difference. It's so egregious that the House Republican Organization is sending out mailers against a 22-year-old University of Illinois student who's already in school, um, or still in school, and he's running for state rep up in the um, <clears throat> Um, northern part of the state, and he is getting mailers saying that he's tied to Mike Madigan, and the guy's 22 years old, never been in office. So this is the type of things that Rauner and the Rauner pay, bought and paid for Republican Party are putting out because they know that Mike Madigan is kind of the boogeyman to people. All right, we heard a very thorough introduction of you. You're, you're a staunch social conservative, fiscal conservative. I'm wondering if you could expand on your political philosophy and, and sort of what shaped your views. Well, I uh, went down to Springfield because it came, became very obvious after the first union negotiation as a Wheaton City Council member that the game against taxpayers is played in Springfield. So I went down there to defend taxpayers. So we have a lot of problems with uh, arbitration rules that um, basically prevent um, managers and taxpayers from having the upper hand in a, a negotiation with the unions. Uh, we have property tax rules that are uh, you know, allow Cook County to assess property completely different than the other 101 counties, and that has been a game against the education formula, for example. So there's not a fair playing field on that. So I went down there to protect taxpayers. Onerous property taxes, <laughs> onerous carve-outs for corporations on special deals for income tax credits. I voted against those, surprisingly, to probably some of you. But um, just the overall tax and spend policies in the Springfield that they de then direct to the local government where you, means you cannot move your state forward. So the pension crisis is one of the biggest things that I've been tackling is the pension crisis. Because the pension rules are written in Springfield and then pushed down to the local levels to fund. And it's literally the reason for your property tax spike, spikes in the, the recent years to fund somebody else's pension. Well, I mean, but there's also uh, you, the state funds a lot of pensions yes. that uh, that local school districts set, and uh, I think you've talked about this, the moral hazard there. I mean, can you explain that to people? You know, the state faces a horrible pension crisis, and a lot of it is because it is picking up the tab for local school districts, mm -hmm. colleges, and universities. How would you propose to change that? So um, here's one thing that I actually agree with Mike Madigan on, because four years ago, he actually said that we should probably push pensions back down to the local level. Now, believe it or not, Bruce Rauner just recommended the same thing in his budget proposal. There's a difference here, though. The way that you do that is you need to give the locals freedom to design their own retirement plans. So I have actually have a plan in place that says all new hires move to a 401k style program. We've actually had this in place for 20 years at the state university uh, level, and 20,000 uh, employees self-select the self-managed plan that we have in place. It delivers a really generous um, retirement at the end of their career, and it's where we need to go. So 
The problem in the state of Illinois is you have $250 billion in pension debt. Most of that's teacher retirement system debt. Uh, and as well as employee health care debt that has never been paid for or no money has been set aside for that. And um, you've got to align interests here. You cannot have school boards pushing out high compensation packages and high salaries and then pushing the pension cost onto state taxpayers. So my brother in Galesburg shouldn't have to pay the higher amount for um, the teachers in Wheaton that are getting compensated at a better, better level. You're uh, never going to get this solved unless you align interests. One of your allies, uh, one of your supporters, David McSweeney, is, yes. is, is opposed to this idea mm -hmm. of, of, of shifting yeah. those costs. And, and you want to bring down property taxes, but if you shift the pension costs to local districts, wouldn't that increase uh, the burden on property taxes and make them have to raise property taxes to fund that? If you don't do it in the right way, certainly that's the rule. The reason the property taxes are so high is that 70% of your property taxes are going to the schools. In the state of uh, Tennessee, 55% of local and, and state taxes collected go to schools instead. We have to reorient our, our spending at the state level so that we can actually take more burden off of the property taxes. So while I agree that property taxes are too high, I think we need to cap them, not freeze them at the highest level. In order to do that, you've got to realign all your spending, but you must push these pensions on the back back down to the university level to the to the public school to the school district level so that they are not putting out enormous pension costs or enormous salary benefits on the backs of taxpayers for example here's the biggest game going on two thirds of the school districts in the state of Illinois the employee does not pay all or part of their pension share pension pickup they don't pay anything, so the taxpayers are paying both the employee's share and the employer share. They're paying for all of it. That happens in Chicago, by the way. It happens in Chicago, where they're only right. paying 2%, two percent, right? It happens in the western suburbs. Look, my school district superintendent in, in Wheaton, he doesn't pay anything towards his own pension. Nothing, and he's sitting on a two to four million dollar pension benefit at when he retires. He pays nothing. The taxpayers pick up all. So you're of it. saying this is a way to, to shift those That's burdens right. to local districts without them having to raise property taxes to fund to fund this this well, added burden they're going to have. There's a couple things here. First, the normal cost for pensions is about nine point six percent. In our plan with the 401k style, it's at 7% on the employer side. So you're already saving 2.6% there. The true cost of pension burden, though, when you include the unfunded liability against the salary costs, is over 50% of the salary cost. No private employer is paying that. They're not paying you $100,000 salary and then putting another $50,000 towards your pension. And yet, that is what we are doing on, with public employees. You, you have a pension reform plan on yes. your website. but. You know, it can't be lost that the Illinois Supreme Court mm -hmm. uh, ruled against any reform to pensions that cut benefits. So raises have to stay the same, 3% yep. cost of living every year. You're kind of in a box, aren't you? How, do you? how do you actually do the kind of pension reform you want when the Supreme Court has said you can't do it? Okay, so our pension, pro we've got like a number of points. The first point is to move new hires into a 401k. And I'm glad we're having this deep pension discussion because it is the biggest burden that we face as Illinoisans. The first thing is new hires to a 401k style program. That is completely constitutional. And it signals to the bond market and to businesses and to individuals that we're finally going to stop digging the hole deeper. It's the one thing that I am certain we can actually get done in Springfield. I've had conversations with uh, firefighters and policemen and teachers and you name it and, and Democrats down there that understand that we need to, t to arrest this. In the state of Illinois, when you look at the cost of our pensions, it's 23% of our income. The average in other states is 3%. So when I talk about us being an outlier in terms of pension obligation, I mean we are an outlier. We are the worst of the worst in terms of that At the same time, category. We uh, have to take care of it. At the same time, you talk about future you know, benefits going forward. But right mm -hmm. now, the unfunded liability is, is the big problem. I mean, there, there's billions of dollars. We'll yep. move off of pensions in a second. Cause yeah, I, I know. But I, it's I, I don't want everyone's topic, got, got guys to, uh, yeah. eyes to glaze over. But this mm -hmm. is money the state owes, uh, 100 mm -hmm. something billion dollars that it has to pay. Okay. So you can't, you can't not pay that, All right, can you? So, no, OK, that, that's a good question. Um, look, I also favor a bankruptcy bill because 
there's there's cities that are literally bankrupt. The city of Springfield, literally every single dollar that they collect in property taxes goes only to pensions. Not roads, not services, not salary for policemen, but only to pensions. 100% of the every property tax dollar they collect. That's how bad it is, and they are not an outlier. There are other cities in that same situation. Now, the unfunded liability, you cannot do anything about that until you've frozen off the systems, which is why the first step is everybody in a 403B tile, style, 401K style pro program. That's the first step. Then a constitutional change, so you can change the benefits on a go forward basis. I know when you guys walk into your private sector job, you, don't, you know that your retirement can be changed in a dime. Everybody else is subject to that. Instead of a 3% match, you're only going to get a 2% match. What are you going to do? You're going to sue over that? Good luck. They can change them on a dime. Now, I know what our Constitution says, but the truth is it's been a game played against taxpayers for a long time. Illinois government has become an one big Ponzi scheme played against taxpayers. That's what we've, that's what we've come. So to clarify, you, you would support uh, ha the state being able to declare bankruptcy or local governments? You can't, you can't have the state declare bankruptcy. The local governments need this relief. They need the relief to discharge de uh, um, uh, debts under a, a reorganization similar to bankruptcy. Okay, they, they absolutely do it. Now, police and fire in the city of Chicago, unfortunately, are about 20% funded. They are headed to insolvency. One downturn of the market means they're, they're kaput. In the next five years, the, the balloon payment, because they kicked the can down the road, which is a bill I voted against, they didn't want to make their pension payment because Chicago couldn't do it. They're spending about $1.1 billion on pensions right now for their four major funds. In, in uh, four years, they're going to have to budget for $2.2 .2 billion, which will be 25% of their general revenues. Think about that in terms of a massive property tax increase. They can't do it. What's going to happen? And oh, by the way, they just sold off the next 40 years of your sales tax receipts, too. They put it in a special fund that allows them to borrow at a, separate, at a lower rate. And if, that, and if for, for whatever happens, if, if they, have to, they had to def default, the people protecting that deal are the bondholders, not the pensioners, not the taxpayers. It's like clearing their credit card, taking out a lower interest credit card, but still piling on debt with not making any spending reforms. And that's what Chicago put through. All right, let's move on uh, to the budget. You've proposed mm -hmm. phasing out the 32% income tax increase yes. that went into place. How do you do that and balance uh, the state budget? It's an enormous task. So one of the first things we need to do is we need to have a forensic audit audit of all of our agencies. Uh, but 85% of Illinoisans say the state of Illinois is on the wrong track. 50% of Illinoisans want to leave the state of Illinois, which is the highest percentage of, of, of any state, and the number one reason is over taxes. So that 32% tax increase that we just had last year is going to accelerate the out-migration. We've had out-migration. We've been the top in the last two years. And we're on track to lose not just one congressional seat, but possibly two in the 2020 census. You cannot build your tax base when your tax base is leaving. So taxes are a really important thing. I say this as a preface to the budget question. The way you do the budget, though, is you, you've, got to, you've got to actually go to somewhat of an austerity budget. So there's a lot of grants that we fund that need to be just deleted until our, our budget is healthy. We can do that. We need massive Medicaid reform. We need a waiver from the federal government to design and implement um, Medicaid um, services that are better, that will better serve our constituents instead of the high cost thing. We need a, uh, the Obamacare expansion on Medicaid puts 650,000 single able-bodied adults onto the Medicaid system. We can't afford it. That system needs to be pared down in the state of Illinois. When we started to do eligibility checks on Medicaid, in the first round of about 300,000 checks, 50% of them were ineligible. But to be clear, mo most of that expansion is funded by the federal government. Right now government. it is, right now. But you watch in the near future, that's going to flip. Regardless, it's still a few hundred million dollars worth of money that we could have savings on. But you know, I mean, we saw this during the budget impasse. There was no agreed upon budget, but there's so many mandates mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of this spending the state is locked into. So it's, it's, it's to say we should cut billion here, a billion there. But legally, constitutionally, the state can't at this point. Well, that's where you have to win the argument with the voters, because the voters are going to have to decide the, the, the way to, to reform this. And so that's why we're going to go straight to the voters and build the pressure to, to get rid of some of those mandates to do so. So pension reform is something that we have to do. 
uh, school consolidation, both at higher education and K through 12, would definitely give us savings, plus it would align accountability. Because uh, even at, for the money that we're spending, we have lots of organizations that are unaccountable for the results that they have. So we spend you know, $35 billion on public education, and yet at the end of it, at, at the end of 13 years, only 50% of them are considered college ready. And when they go on to college, actually, 40% of them need remediation at the higher education level. So we're not doing a good job educating kids. Here in the city of Chicago, only 25% of the kids are at grade level. And you're spending a lot of money and getting no results. It's got to end. Talking about education, I'm sure there's people in here that would be interested in this. Uh, public education, public, uh, the colleges and universities are losing students uh, in mm -hmm. Illinois, and their tuition is going up. How do you? keep students uh, in state, and how do you make college more affordable for them? Well, just to be clear here, people want to blame this on the budget impasse. The truth is we've been losing um, college, uh, our high school graduates way before um, 2014 even. We've been losing high school graduates. And uh, in that year, we actually lost 16,000 high school graduates that chose a different path, chose to go to a school out of state. We're still um, um, seeing 10,000 plus students leave every single year to choose a different avenue for education. The number one reason they're, they're leaving, though, is because it's unaffordable. We are 20 to 50% higher than our conference peer when you look at our state universities. 20 to 50% higher than our conference peers. People just can't afford to, to be here. The same time frame um, since uh, 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 education uh, administration has grown 26% at the same time uh, enrollment has decreased 3%. So, so there's got, more to tackle with administrative there's more, costs, There's saying. administrative costs. Uh, everything that we pay for in um, the state of Illinois is higher cost. From wanting to build or expand a building, you've got enormous union prevailing wage rates that, and project labor agreements that interfere with getting the best price possible in those things. You've got um, tenure rules. Now, I mean, a lot of people want to blame it on, well, you're just not funding education from the state level. Well, I, I think most people don't understand this, but actually we're number three in the nation in terms of state support per full-time equivalent student. Number three. Number three. We're not, we're not number 47th. We're not third from the bottom. We're number three. It's just that half of that state support goes to, for pensions. One half of our state support goes to somebody else's pension at higher education. So you're including the, the amount of money put into the SUR, State yes. University Retirement mm -hmm. System. So when you factor yeah. that in, we're third. But that's, look, I'm not factoring that in. People who do this analysis are factoring, factoring that in. They, this is their numbers. I didn't make these up to benefit my argument. These are their numbers. Even when you take away that half of it goes to, because you have to, that's, that's the cost. That is state support. I mean, that's the other thing. People want to pretend that, uh, oh, well, that's just a pension payment. That's not true state support. Hello? That is all going into education support at the higher education level or at the local level. You have to factor it in because other states don't have these enormous pension benefits like we have. In the last 30 year, pension benefits in the state of Illinois have grown over 1,000%. At the same time, personal income has grown just over 100%. So 10 times. Also in Illinois, there's a monetary assistance program. This yes. Is, this is a mm -hmm. uh, taxpayer-funded program to provide uh, assistance mm -hmm. for college for low-income uh, residents. Do you support uh, keeping that as it is, expanding it, reducing it? Great question. Oh my gosh, you, you're, you're hitting on some good <laughs> stuff here. Um, I, re I like that question for a couple of reasons. One. Our monetary assistance program really needs to have a clawback provision. So if you don't com complete, that we, the taxpayers should be able to claw back that money. That's just the, the, the way it should be. Number two, though, uh, there was this real push like we need to expand MAP grants. And so I did a little, I did a little bit of analysis with some staff um, when the teacher retirement system decided to lower its investment rate of return from 7.5% to 7%, which means that taxpayers had to kick more money in to the next year's pension payment. Um, and you know, so that cost was gonna be an additional $400 million, okay? So I said to myself, well, what is the um, economic, what's the opportunity cost of $400 million? That's an economic term, where's Terry? You like, that, I mean, that's, isn't that chapter one of any economic book? What's the opportunity cost of one thing versus another, all right? 
So um, the opportunity cost of $400 million meant that we could, have, we could have increased our MAP grants two times. We could have doubled the amount of MAP grants we were giving. Instead, it's going to a broken pension system because they cha changed one actuarial assumption, which was their investment rate of return. So it has huge costs. That $400 million could have bought 6,500 new teachers at the average cost or 10,000 new teachers at the average starting cost. That $400 million was enough to take half of the people that are on a waiting list for disability services. This is the developmentally disabled are on a waiting list for services. It could have taken half of that list and put half of them in home-based services and the other half in a community integrated living arrangement. So the pension cost when you're spending 25 to 28 percent of your general revenues on somebody else's pension, there's a huge crowd out effect. We are number one in supporting pensioners. We're number 48th in supporting developmentally disabled in this state. In this state. So to clarify on the MAP grants, so you would yes. say if you, you, you could increase funding for MAP grants no. if, if you if you, if you got money out of the pension system? Uh, look, we could increase money, we could for a lot increase of funding for a variety of stuff. I'm not sure it would go to MAP grants. Maybe, it, there, maybe there's a more worthy program out there for higher education. I, I, it, but I, I would say we need more accountability in MAP grants. We need a clawback provision if p kids don't complete. We've, we've, we've done a lot of pocketbook issues, but we got to talk about HB 40, which yeah. is the abortion bill, which is That's what launched. That's a pocketbook issue. It is a, po it, it launched, a pocketbook it issue. It launched, launched your campaign. Um, what would you do on the issue of abortion if you were governor, and how would you get a likely Democratic majority uh, in the House and Senate to go along with you? Paris, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Because you see, when a governor signs legislation into law, there's nearly nothing you can do with most of that except put together a repeal bill and then hope you can pass that. But given the makeup of the Senate, given the makeup of the House, what Governor Rauner did is nearly permanent until you flip the House and flip the Senate per, um, um, politically. So th that's, that's what's so awful about a Republican governor putting ta in taxpayer funding of abortion. Because Republicans, if you read our party platform, it invokes in its preamble Ronald Reagan, um, Abraham Lincoln, Everett Dirksen, and Henry Hyde. Hi Henry Hyde is most prominently known for the Hyde Amendment, which said, fine, you, you, you guys won Roe v. Wade at the federal level, but taxpayers shouldn't have to fund it. So Governor Rauner, via his signature, put in something so permanent that you have to change the entire political spectrum down there. Now, on abortion, obviously, whether it's um, abortion or um, uh, sanctuary state status or any uh, illegal immigration or immigration laws or any of that, we are going to follow federal law. We're going to follow federal law. That's, that's it. But um, taxpayers should not have to fund something like this. And by the way, the state is bankrupt, bankrupt. And he put a brand new open-ended entitlement program uh, when we can't afford to, to fund education or MAP grants or the developmentally disabled. And you mentioned sanctuary state law uh, for undocumented immigrants. Now, he's saying mm -hmm. this is, does not make Illinois a sanctuary state, mm -hmm. this bill that he put into place that would mm -hmm. basically um, you know, prohibit local law enforcement from acting as immigration agents, essentially. Uh, how, how, would, how do you differ on this issue from him? Well, listen, uh, uh, when I called my state's attorney about this, he basically said it ruins the spirit of cooperation between federal, local, and state law enforcement. And then additionally, you had Carol Marine at the Democrat gubernatorial debate ask all the governor candidates, are you willing to give up millions of dollars in uh, public um, safety grants and, and from the federal government to remain a sanctuary state. Every single Democrat raised their hand. So every single Democrat gubernatorial candidate thinks we're a sanctuary state, as does Carol Marine. And you know, here's the deal. If you're the governor, are you just signing legislation willy-nilly? No, he knows what that bill did and what it means, and so he signed it. Um, and we're going to get to your, your questions real quick, but I do have to bring up uh, the, the ad that, that, mm -hmm. that, that was in support of you that, that a lot of people took offense to. You, you initially, after that, said, I don't see what's so offensive about it. Um, do you still feel that way? Did you see where some people might have taken offense to a transgender person being sort of portrayed as just basically a dude with a wig on. Um, is, 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 that, is that anything that maybe you've thought about since then? 
Listen, that ad actually shows the policies that Governor Rauner put in place. And what's unfortunate is that folks don't understand the policy Governor Rauner put in place. So we need to show it upright and, and upfront what, exactly what happened. So um, he did with the education bill, bail out Chicago public schools that have $17 billion in debt. And he socialized that cost against all taxpayers statewide by allowing that funding formula to go forward where they can continue to hide their wealth and push their, their payments into, um, into the formula where we're gonna pick up that cost. So that's accurate de depiction. We truly are paying for taxpayer funded abortion, which that ad depicted. We truly did bail out um, Exelon and their two nuclear plants that they considered unprofitable, yet the company overall made $2.2 billion net income the year before they signed that bill. And that bill is a $2.35 billion subsidy when we export 25% of our energy. So now you guys are absolutely subsidizing energy that goes across state lines. <coughs> true, true depiction. Sanctuary state, again, we covered that already. True depiction of what, who he stood with. And as far as the transgender um, uh, birth certificate bill, that's, he, we already had a process where you could change the sex on that official document. It's just that you had to have a medical doctor sign off on that with medical intervention. Now, and this is the problem, people don't understand, you literally can put on a dress, and as long as a, a mental, licensed mental health professional signs off that you feel that you're the opposite sex, that you can go and have your birth certificate changed. And so, and this also includes uh, licensed mental, mental health professionals outside of our state. So it doesn't take a licensed mental health professional it, with our state standards, it could be outside of our state. So true depiction of that ad, true depiction. I know it's kind of shocking when you look into the, the policy details, which I've been trying to do my entire time down there in Springfield is to explain people the games being played against them, the details of the bill, because these have real outcomes. And so that's what all that ad was about, policy ad. We have to get to, to audience Q&A, but I'm going to ask you one last sure. question, yes or no answer. If Bruce Rauner is the nominee of your party, will you support him? I will vote for him. You'll vote for him. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's get to, so students, uh, we're going to go to students first. Are you a student here? Okay. Uh, right here in the front. Uh, what, whatever you want. Hi, my name is Musa. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit about some mental inconsistencies in uh, your platform so far, just looking back. In 2014, you uh, opposed a bill that would ban conversion therapy for LGBTQ youth. Um, and saying, uh, this isn't an exact quote because I don't have a paper in front of me, but you said that uh, you didn't think that the government should legislate on what people felt about themselves one way or another. Um, what you just said about transgender people, as well as like stances you've taken on traditional marriage, as well as trans people being able to, like I got for myself, my uh, birth certificate change, uh, indicate that that might not always be the case. So when you were talking about your budget and the grants that we might have to delete, how do we know as voters that you won't just delete support for the marginalized and vulnerable people who don't live and act the way that you do? Well, you have the same rights as anybody else. You have your constitutional rights. That's, and that's what we're gonna live by. There you go. But the ban on uh, transgender therapy literally was a ban on parental rights. It said that a parent could not take their child to a psychologist to even determine how they feel about themselves if they had gender dysphoria. It banned the practice of a parent taking a minor child in for a mental health evaluation and counseling. That's what that bill did. That's very extreme measure to take to say that you must buy into this as a parent and that you have no parental rights with your child. That's the extreme behavior there. But look, everybody has the same rights. But I'll tell you what, I, uh, my husband and I are not on board with um, you know, fully developed males being in the same locker room with our daughter. We're just not. We're That's not on board right. with that. So there you go. Uh, what, what, you had a, was that a follow-up or was that? Yeah, I guess my follow-up is just 
how do you say that you can legislate what another person's body is? And I'm not asking about like your specific views, like right. you answer circuitously about what the conversion therapy then is, ignoring, of course, the fact that abusive parents exist. My own parents, in fact, would have gladly sent me to an abusive camp that would have caused me to kill myself if they had the chance. Mm -hmm. However, what I'm asking about is how we know as voters that you won't take away programs for people who need it, vulnerable trans people of color. How do we know that you're not going to delete those programs? You'd have to tell me what programs you're talking about. Because you have the right to get a MAP grant. You have a right to get um, certain tax breaks. You have a right to fill out your, your uh, 1040 the same way as anybody else. You have a right to get a driver's license. You have a right to what rights are inherent to, to one particular person versus another one that you're talking about. And you know, parents have a right to, to t handle their child and their needs in the way that they see appropriate. Now, when you're after you're 18, have at it. You have the right to go in the military. You have the right to vote. You have the right to act an adult. You have the right to do wh whatever you want. I'm not interested in legislating anything like that. But that bill was a ban on parental rights. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's move on to another student question uh, over there. Uh, hi, Senator. My name is Max. Oh, representative, um, but thanks for the, sorry, I'm sorry. the promotion. Hi, well, Max. I'm not really a promotion. Um, one, of, one of the points you've been critical of Governor Rauner on in the campaign was how he's handled Speaker Madigan. Mm -hmm. um, now, I mean, obviously, we don't know if he'll still be there, present scandal included. But assume for a second that he or someone like him is the speaker and you're governor. How would you differently deal with, with Madigan as speaker? Listen, the, the guy run, does rule with an iron fist. There's no doubt about it. He's, he sets the rules. He sets the legislative agenda. He allows some bills to go in and out. So what you have to do is you have to do the really, really hard work by build, building coalition support and building voter support for your initiatives. That's what you have to do. And you have to work hand in hand with your Democrat colleagues to win them over. But look, you can only defy economics so long in this state before it comes up to bite you. And we're at that point. We are a fiscal basket case. We are the worst run state in the union. And the reason Mike Madigan should resign is over two reasons. One, this hashtag Me Too movement that he has completely ignored and been complicit in failing to put a legislative inspector general in for three years knowing that there's 27 complaints about it. He should, he should be resigned over that. He should also resign over his handling of everything when it comes to the finance of the state of Illinois. But if he's still there, guess what? You don't, you know, you don't win friends and influence enemies by calling names, especially with somebody by, like Speaker Mike Madigan. So we'll work with Mike Madigan. We'll work around Mike Madigan to get things across. And if he doesn't want to work with us at all and the voters don't want to wake up to the realities that are facing the state of Illinois, if they want to stay in this media bubble that doesn't take a deep look at the policy, so be it. We'll run our agencies effect effectively. We'll make sure that the, the Quincy Veterans Home doesn't continue to operate after 13 people have died, 11 lawsuits against the taxpayers, and after Browner's PR stunt of staying there for six days, you have four more Legionella disease uh, uh, um, cases, and still nobody's been moved out. So we'll run these agencies effectively. We'll make sure that when it comes to Medicaid spending, there's not this big question mark about where $7 billion was spent. We'll do the hard work to make sure that our agencies are efficient and as effective as possible, that every single grant that goes out to a not-for-profit for job training or medical services or child care is actually um, effective in its reach. That's what we're going to do. It's hard, gut-wrenching work, but a venture capitalist likes to make a deal, wash their hands, move on to the next deal. And that's who Rauner is. We just didn't know it back in 2014. Thank you for your question. There's, there's a um, um, couple things I have to follow up there. You mentioned sexual harassment, which is obviously mm -hmm. a huge topic yeah. in Springfield right now. Um, do you, uh, would you, do you call on, should the leader of the Republican, uh, House Republican, Senate Republican, should they all release a list of, of complaints and, 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 and how they've dealt with them? Like uh, Speaker Madigan put out an impartial list of, of complaints in his office. Should, should all leaders do the same? <clears throat> so I called for that a long time ago. I called for them to make available to the voters, because you have an election coming up, to make available, and they've hidden it for three years. I called for them to, with the accusers' names redacted, at least identify what the complaints are and who they're against. And I think that's fair, given the fact that they've sat on these complaints for three years, and nothing was done. 
So um, I think that's a, that by way of transparency, that'd be very effective. Has the governor been it. transparent on this issue? I mean, I don't agree. I don't think that he has either. I don't think, the, and I think there's going to be some more information coming out about that. You've already, I've already had media inquiries about um, Mr. Morashko, and and, and this, there's this been is a speculation. Counsel yes. in the governor's office, Dennis Morashko, yeah. where there's been speculation and an investigation of of right. harassment. So we still don't know the details on that as well. And I've called out both sides of my party, or both parties on this this problem. You know, you had the legislative inspector general um, is a, a, appointed by. Um, uh, the, the, the speakers or the leaders with agreement, but you have a bipartisan committee there, and none of those committee members said anything about it, about it being vacant for that long. Three years it was Yeah, vacant. three yeah. years vacant. Uh, and you also brought up Lee Janella mm -hmm. in, in you know, the Quincy Veterans Home. This, yes. that for those who haven't followed the story, um, uh, several veterans that live in this home have died from Legionnaire's disease, and it's, it's a disease born out mm -hmm. of uh, the bacteria in the water, um, and it also has been revealed that uh, that the governor has sort of uh, really tried to manage this crisis and, and, and not be transparent about the extent of it. There have been more people recently in that veterans' home that have, have fallen ill with Legionnaire's disease. Um, is, is this uh, is is this did the governor uh, let this uh, become a a bigger issue? Is he responsible for the deaths and the sickness there? Uh, of course, he's responsible for, for some of the later sicknesses and by not moving on this issue soon enough and moving these people out of this, at this place. Um, and, and then on top of it, he's, he's responsible for the entire political cover-up of this because WBEZ had foiled a bunch of emails, and if you've seen those emails, it's very obvious that they are doing, uh, they're doing their best to hide what's going on there and to, to come up with the best message in terms of how it would look politically rather than solving the problem. So, this so would you is not close what you this do. veterans' home? Absolutely, I would close it right now. And I'll tell you what, my colleague who runs these types of um, um, nursing homes, he said all of his people would have been moved out. He would have moved every single resident out until he fixed that problem. Why? Because he's not, he's not capped at $100,000 per lawsuit. It would have been millions and millions of dollars worth of lawsuits if this had happened in a private facility. But we're allowing it to happen here in the government. And um, that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate because it's a horrible death to die of Legionella, Legionella as well. And uh, it's preventable. It's preventable. It's just that it's in that piping. You cannot get it out. And I've, I have visited the facility and have talked to the staff. But you're subjecting both the staff and the residents to additional uh, problems. Any, uh, any more student questions? Uh, we have a student right back there. And we'll get to, we'll get to general questions as well. You criticized the legislature for assuming a lower rate of return on pensions and thus paying more into the fund after, for decades, not paying very much into the fund, which is how we've got this massive unfunded liability. At what point do you foresee looking somewhere other than payments to pension for general fund revenues and to fund other programs? Good question. I actually don't criticize them for a lower investment rate of return. The truth is they weren't making that return to begin with over time. And they really should have more of a risk-free rate of return, which is you know four or five percent. The problem is, is that when you lower that investment rate, then the amount that you have to pay in every year to cover that liability just balloons, and you literally can't afford it in your budget. So for decades, the politicians have not been honest with their actuarial analysis about what they 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 could afford and what should have been put away for the benefit increases. So like I said before, in the last three years, you've had you've had 1,000% increase in benefits, over that actually, all right? And um, if you had actually had a risk-free rate, if you had understood how these pensions were ballooning, you would have had a decrease in the salary acceleration that goes along with it, okay? And at some point, and this is really why the pension protection clause was put in it in place. They put that pension because I've read the I've read the the, the uh, dialogue going back and forth about why um, they put in the pension protection clause. And you're saying at the constitutional yeah, convention. yeah the constitutional when, convention in right. seven in 1970 when they did this, they did that because they felt like if they made sure that you always had to pay in exactly what was going to be owed and that this was a set in stone that you could, had to pay this, they felt it would have tamped down 
the amount of compensation so it would never get out of control. They never counted on the politics and the, and the voters not understanding, the media being complicit and not explaining as these benefits grew and grew and grew and grew, as the salaries grew. I mean, if we still had the same tenants in our pension plan that we had in 1970, this we would not even have a crisis. But they went from a 1.5 multiplier to a 2.2 multiplier. They went from a you have to be um, 62 or over 60 to you could retire you know, with two years of sick accrual and retire before you're 55. And then they went from a 1% uh, a COLA to a 3% 3% compounded COLA Okay, over time. So this is what's ramped up this pension obligation that is enormous and literally the biggest scam out there for taxpayers. We can't afford these. These will be discharged one way or another. And I think pensioners need to figure that out. Nobody's sticking around to pay these pensions. We had, a, we had another question right here. So, thank you. Um, last year, Bruce ran our sign like the so-called um, um, like Trust Act, which mm -hmm. prevents uh, state and local law enforcement agents from cooperating with groups like ICE and other like federal law enforcement agents for immigration. So like, if you are elected governor, what actions um, would you take in order to um, allow like state uh, law enforcement agents to cooperate with the federal government to ensure that like illegal aliens are you know arrested and deported, which what um, which is right. what the law says currently. Just well, sure, you know what though the, the governor runs the Illinois State Police, and the Illinois State Police will be in full compliance under uh, Governor Ives' administration with federal immigration law. Period. I think we have a state representative here had his hand up. <laughs> Yeah, can you give some examples where you've worked with others on the other side of the aisle uh, without compromising principle? Uh, sure, there's two prominent examples last year alone. Um, uh, I worked with uh, Greg Harris on the network adequacy bill. This is a bill that basically said that you had to have sufficient um, um, operational places uh, and protections for people that use health insurance to make sure they have access to health insurance. So it's called your network had to be adequate enough to actually make insurance um, workable, especially in Southern Illinois and other parts of the state. And I got this bill, actually I started this legislation, I started it two years ago. And I started when a constituent in Naperville, an insurance salesman said, look, uh, these big guys, these insurance companies and hospitals, when they can't get along, they will break an insurance contract in the middle of the contract period. They'll just break off. And so the, the person who bought the policy and bought the premium because they knew they wanted to go to, to the University of Chicago hospitals or they wanted to go to the Loyola set, set of hospitals, when these insurance companies and the hospitals would break, break their relationship, the policyholder was left out. No network that was adequate for them even though they had already paid in the premium. So I presented yeah. this bill to fix this, to give these guys protections because they signed a contract too and they should be had, they, these people should have to fulfill it. I, I, I filed that bill, Greg Harris was very favorable to it, but he had a lot more experience in this area than I did. So I handed the bill off to him and 18 months later it became this really huge massive bill called network adequacy that deals with making sure that folks who buy into a premium and expect health services actually have an adequate network to service them and then allows protections when the hospitals and insurance company for whatever reason do break parties, they have a three month um, you know, reprieve on, on things like that. So that was one of them. Another bill dealt with condo owners that were getting taken advantage of by our really uh, section 15 of our condo act which was a very lightly used provision um, before but has become more important as renters or, or as agencies come in, buy up condo properties and return it to rental. Well, if you had already owned a condo, you had literally no protections for, even though you had your property rights taken from you. So I worked with uh, Thaddeus Jones on that bill and my amendment was immediately accepted with almost no questions asked. They knew it was a good bill. So we work on those types of issues all the time. We have time for about two more questions and this gentleman had his hand <coughs> up for a while. Hi, uh, I'm a GNEI supporter, so full disclosure, I'm also not a student, so. <laughs> I think you profiled me as a non-student, so. But I'm, I'm very interested, uh, four years ago there were four candidates and there were I think six debates, 
This year, there's been zero debates other than the Tribune thing. So I wonder if you could address that. And I think Paris would be an excellent debate moderator if we could get one in the next 15 days. Thank you for your endorsement. I would, <laughs> yeah, you would be. You'd be fabulous. Oh, um, no, look, I think it's important that voters know uh, where we stand on the issues. And you cannot rely on the other campaigns, mailers, and, and TV commercials to tell everybody about everything. So if you go to the only time that Bruce Rauner would agree to meet with me in public and have a substanti substantive discussion on the issues was in front of the Chicago Tribune editorial board endorsement session. Fortunately, they did live stream it and record it so people can go there and watch the, how he and I interacted and what our policy differences were. But it, it's shameful. You've, you've had a number of Democrat debates, and we've not been able to speak. In fact, we've not really had a debate. Um, and that, and that, I don't know why, why he's such a coward on it, but um, you know, voters have a right to, 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 to know what, where we stand, and they're the ones that are really at loss here. We will have Representative Ives as a public service announcement on Chicago tonight uh, in the coming week, I think. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think we are. Yeah, uh, and, and the uh, invitation obviously is, is open to Governor Rauner, who has declined our invitation, obviously. Uh, He's Mr. declined everything because we have been open. Springfield Journal Register declined, League of Women Voters declined, everybody. He's declined everybody. Uh, Mr. Berkowitz. Uh, so down 51 to 31 in, oops, sorry. So down 51 to 31 in a poll taken about a week ago. Mm -hmm. Down, I don't know, he's got, if he wants to, $20 million he could spend in the next two weeks. How do you overcome that 20 point disadvantage in the next two weeks? And can he get away with the lie because he can just bury it by burying you spending so much that lie doesn't rise to the top? Those two questions. Thank you, yeah, no, no, there's no doubt. Uh, you know, people want to, um, are, are universally disgusted at money and politics, but apparently uh, money buys your message. And for Bruce Rauner to spend $4 million in the last two weeks lying about my record, when we haven't even collected $4 million this entire campaign, is what you now are seeing on the commercials and seeing in your mailboxes. And um, that's shameful. That's shameful. I mean, if you want your elections to go to the highest bidder, and the one with the most money, then why don't we just have an auction and, and sell it off that way? So it's, it, it takes a lot of work for voters to become informed. And the, diff, the decisions, the policy choices are, the policy is so difficult to understand that you can't put it down into an eight-second soundbite. Paris would love if I could do eight-second soundbites. I can't do them, which is why we need a full debate about what's going on. But as far as the gap in the polling, we're not worried. What that, also, that same Paul Simon polling proved is that Governor Rauner will lose to a Democrat in November. And so we think Republican voters deserve a stark contrast, somebody who can make the arguments and stand up uh, for conservative values and win on the policy front. Because I've been a leader on property tax reform, a leader on this assessment system. Things that you're hearing now about happening in Cook County uh, property tax assessment system, I yelled on the House floor about them three years ago. And I gave Governor Bruce Rauner an entire agenda on how to, how to win that argument, and he failed to deliver. So, it, you know, it's, it's, an upward, it's an uphill chance um, um, battle here to connect with voters in the next two weeks. But we have a ground game, and we have people working for us every single day, and all he has is his checkbook. That's all he has. So we're going to keep working until the last voter is uh, turned out for our side. If I could follow up on the assessment part of that. Yeah. Um, you know, on, on the Democratic side, Chris Kennedy has called for an end to lawmakers serving uh, as property tax appeal attorneys in their, in their other life. A direct shot at Mike Madigan, mm -hmm. who has gotten rich off of the system where he, he, he represents uh, clients that uh, go before Joe Berrios or go before the Board of Review and get their Assessments, Lord, would you support uh, something like that where a lawmaker couldn't act uh, as, a, as a tax attorney in that capacity? Well, there's certainly conflicts of interest when it comes to that. So I, I'm not opposed to, to that at all, quite frankly. It's just that um, the Democrats have, they're just now finding this as a problem. Are you kidding me? This has been a problem for decades. And they've not said a word, not a word about this property tax assessment thing. And I made this argument a long time ago. 
And I made this with the education bill. If you don't fix the assessment system, you literally fix nothing in the education funding formula. It's all based off of property wealth. As, and the idea that Chicago is considered in our new formula one of the poorest, property poorest districts, even poorer than Fort Heights, is outrageous. It's outrageous, and yet that's what it does. Well, this is what we're talking about, the education bill that, that, that changed the formula where yes. poor school districts get more money. So are you saying Chicago should, should be getting less money than it's getting from the it, state right Absolutely. Now? It's getting a favored grant of at least $250 million to begin with. Now we're picking up their pensions. Now, now, we're, now they're allowed to still under-assess their property. They have $6.6 .6 billion hidden in their TIFs. They are, they have, you're, you know, in Chicago, you've only got about a 1.3% tax rate. The rest of the state, the average is 2.6%. So you're at half the cost on property tax rates. You're hiding your wealth everywhere. And when you looked at the top 12 sales in 2015 on commercial property, they were only assessed at 42% of their market value. It's a game being played again and again. It's a game played against all taxpayers statewide. And I told Rauner what was going on three years ago, waived all that information on the House floor, gave him a program that would have um, generated uh, the, the data and the information that he needed to take the fight on for taxpayers, and he refused to do it. He refused to do it. But there's nobody who's, buddy who's playing this game bigger than Mike Madigan. That's a very specific issue to end on. Do we have uh, do we have any other any other audience questions? Any anything else that we haven't uh, addressed? We kind of addressed a whole uh, breadth of stuff. Well, okay. In that case, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank the IOP and thank you, Representative Jeannie Ives, for speaking. Thank you.